Welcome to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast. Hi, I'm Keith Casabon, and thank you for listening to another episode of the You First podcast. Before we get into it, just a quick reminder to subscribe to the show. You can simply visit disabilityrightsflorida.org slash podcast, where you'll find links to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and more. Today, we'll hear from Angela Muir Van Etten, who just published her third book titled Always an Advocate. As a dual citizen of New Zealand and the United States, Angela qualified as a lawyer in both countries. She also served as national president of both the Little People of New Zealand and Little People of America. Angela has been a legal writer and editor of law books for Thomson Reuters, a staff writer for the Christian Law Association, and a disability advocate for the Coalition for Independent Living Options. Her articles on dwarfism advocacy have been published in the LPA Magazine, LPA Today, and online in the Huffington Post blog. Angela has international media and public speaking experience and has been interviewed by TV icons such as Phil Donahue, Sally Jesse Raphael, and John Stossel. I'm very excited to have her as my guest today, so let's get started. Hey, Angela, thank you so much for being our guest. I'm really excited to read your new book, Always an Advocate. And so I'd like to start off with a question about that. It seems like it's not a random title. Can you tell us why you chose that and, and how it describes you? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm really happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this uh, conversation. The title, you're right, it, you, it's not random. It really came out of a presentation that I did at a school. And one of the questions of, from a student afterwards was, how long have you been an advocate? And I, that really got me to stop and think I, on the spot. I thought, well, I said, always. Oh, I can't think of a time when I was not an advocate. Mm. So I, that's it's always an advocate. It just sort of came together as a result of my experience. Well, <laughs> I'm an <laughs> advocate ever since. So like I can just think of, you know, there are moments in your childhood that stand out. And I remember being in school and the kids were running out into the playground and I got left behind. So I just stood at the door of the classroom and said, hey, wait for me. And it's <laughs> like right from the beginning, I just remember having to advocate for myself to not be left behind, not be overlooked. And as an adult, being always advocated for myself, you can be standing in line, you know, where there's no, not like in the bank where they put... <laughs> markers for where you should stand, but Mm -hmm. waiting to get served and people jump ahead of you. They think you're a kid with the other adult. So you just have to speak up and say, excuse me, but I was ahead of you, you know, and oh, I'm sorry. And then not not everybody says sorry, but so just to advocate to get help, somebody pass you something, uh, job interviews, you name it. I'm always advocating about something. And then, so it started with self-advocacy, that's how it describes me, but then it moves on to, as you get older, to advocate for other people. Mm-hmm. And so as in an organization for little people would call me for advice and I would give them guidance. And then as I had the opportunity, which I'm saying had, because I have now retired from my paid job, but I don't call myself retired, but I'm older now, but as I be- had the opportunity to be a system advocate. So I was working with people for a center in the Center for Independent Living, advocating for them and, and personal issues relating to education, their benefits, whatever, but also systems advocacy, going, going before school boards, county commissions, elected officials, and then also I mentioned already little people in America I've advocated as a volunteer for issues that will come up shortly in our conversation, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, indeed. Well, I do want to talk more about your book, but I did want to mention that you've written two books prior to Always an Advocate. So if you could tell us about those two books briefly and your journey of writing over these last 30 years. Right. Well, I first got the idea to write a book when I was a young adult, and and that one was Dwarf Start of Doll Houses. I was a single uh, person, and I planned the whole thing to cut off, you know, before I did get married later. Even though I finished the book after I was married, the book sticks with my perspective from a, a single person. So it's oh. birth from birth through the young adult. And so that was the, the first one. Then there was a long pause. <laughs> <laughs> and like 32 years before I got to the second book, and some people, the second book is Pass for Your Shoes. And that one is, I, I just was in short 
shorthand call it our marriage story. That one came out only a year ago. People actually wanted that book because when I had written the first one, I I actually went beyond. My perspective was from a single person, but I continued on after I was married talking about issues related to dwarfism. Mm -hmm. And Robert, my husband, person I married 40 years ago, (laughs) this month, he... Yeah, he was in the book, and from uh, as a little person, and, and also he had been a, a president, he was the president of Little People of America when we met. So people were expecting to read about him because they knew I was married when the book came out. So they were disappointed, and so they oh. said, oh, we were expecting to read about you getting married because, you know, it was quite a surprising story because I had come from New Zealand on a fellowship, and so the whole thing was a whirlwind, and and of course the international marriage and immigrating here to the United States. So we just would say, "Oh well, that'll be book two. Well, <laughs> book two was thirty two years in the making. <laughs> yeah, so there were a lot of things that came along that diverted me, shall we say, or detours, as we call it in the subtitle. Navigating life's detours is part of the subtitle for Pass Me Your Shoes." And one of them was, of course, meeting Robert and getting married, immigrating to the United United States, having to go back to law school, getting involved Mm -hmm. in LPA leadership. And uh, and then the final one that got in the way was heart surgery and had to have an aortic valve replacement. So then after that, I was able to go back to work. It's a successful surgery that was like eight years ago, but I no longer had the energy that it takes to work, be involved in church and write. So the when I retired is when I wrote Always an Advocate. So that was my plan when I retired after I went on my Medicare birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's it. I I have to write this book because the third one had um been started and that one was detoured by the heart surgery. So yeah, there there's been a long road. And f- in fact, the original plan was there to only be a second book, wait for book two. Oh. But by now, I had so much material in 32 years, and I had a very um, good friend and a writer herself, a, a professor in the university and sociologist, and she recommended after she read a band of copies, she said, you've really got two books in here. It's going to appeal to two different audiences. So she recommended oh. I pull them apart, which I did not want to do. <laughs> it's going to take a lot of That means um, I have to write a third book now. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, it meant I had to sort of separate them right. and explain the gaps, you know. And so this sure. how actually, it's a sort of the book, Always an Advocate, became, I divided it into three parts because I couldn't go chronological anymore. And, you know, because the book editor that I had, she said, oh, there's a big gap here. And I said, well, you know, people are going to wonder what happened in between. Well, that gap happened because of, you know, becoming two, two different books. That makes so sense. So that's why I didn't organize the Always an Advocate chronologically. It's topical. Yeah, it is. And that makes it unique and a very interesting read I found, which perfect segue. Let's talk a little bit about Always an Advocate. So you mentioned this in three separate parts. Part one discusses the times that either you or your husband, Robert, as you already mentioned, served as president of Little People of America. So what are some of the accomplishments that you and Robert had while serving as a LPA president? Well, one of the, Robert was actually president twice. And so the first time yeah. He and they at that time was a two year term, and he got he that's when he met me and got done <laughs> a third traction. So he was a good president, but he didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of what he had wanted to do. So he came back as president like two years later after having a two year gap and worked on getting Little People of America to be a tax exempt organization. And so that it's clearly the organization was involved in educational, medical, charitable activities. We have a medical advisory board that volunteers, medical specialists, work a lot of workshops, educational workshops on every any number of topics that you can think of. Uh, there's grants for scholarships for a university in a college and people are help charitable things. So we could see that. The organization on a flight for tax exemption, 
and the funding was needed for the don- you kind of it was already a non profit, but donors couldn't get a, a deduction for their donations. So uh. in order for the organization to grow beyond just being a volunteer organization, it you needed to have that and so you could go for grants and get more staff. Mm, that really makes sense. One paid staff member who was handling membership and, you know, sort of so a lot of phone calls. But so now it's still not a heavily staffed organization. There are three, three and a couple of people that are paid a stipend for their work, but it's primarily a volunteer organization. But so the tax exemption was a huge thing because it involved mm-hmm. having to change the original charter and the uh, bylaws and getting the membership on board. And a lot of the people who had been in leadership for many years prior to Robert coming along <laughs> were thinking this is a bad idea. It was a foundation that did funnel money into the organization, into LPA, mm-hmm. but they held the one who holds the purse strings holds the power. So mm. Robert's idea was to get it back into the hands of the membership. And that's why he wanted little people there, LPA, if I may say it's the abbreviation, back into the hands of the people who would benefit. And another thing when I, I noticed when I first came from, the, uh, from New Zealand was that the parents didn't get a vote. And, and it's a family, oh. it's a very interesting organization because it still has as four members, the par- the parents of the children with dwarfism and the adults with dwarfism. They're one organization. It's mm. not a parent separate from the little people. Uh-huh. And so, but they didn't get to, to vote at all. And so that, that was changed because they're the ones trying to, to come and bring their kids to these meetings and traveling across country sometimes, the annual conference does move around the country so that more people have an opportunity to attend. But still, uh, that's going to be once in a, a blue moon that you'll get it close to you. So people have to have to fly to meetings and stay in fancy hotels now because the organization's so big. You need a large hotel with the conference. Oh, right. Rooms, you know, banquet halls, you know, assembly rooms and things like that. So. That was the main, a lot of two things that he did. And also he believed in uh, the members being informed. He had a uh, monthly, there, as, as I keep saying, for volunteers, LPA could not, cannot run without volunteers. There, there are, at this time, I'll just give the numbers. There are 70 local chapters, 14 districts, which cover you know, two or three states and then the national organization. So. It's that there's many volunteers are involved in running the organization. So he wanted to keep them informed. And so he reinstated something that a president many years earlier had. They called it the golden sheet. So he wrote to like once a month a newsletter to the 80 elected people at that time. It's more than that now. And just keeping them informed, keeping and having people be more involved in decision making. There was a lot of things. Uh, and then, of course, one of the things that happened in his second term also was the dwarf tossing problem came up when he was president. So he oh. appointed the right people, you know, with obviously with his support and involvement, but he couldn't do it all. So it's a lot of people stepped up to help get it stopped. Right. Yeah. You know? And and me, for me, I, one of the main things I came in to do, I really was the reluctant uh, president because I was trying to write these books, the second and third book. Oh, right. Oh, of course. Uh, but I had, I got, because there was a, shall we say, you know, I hesitated to write about it, but it's such a big part of the story. There was a really bad season or period of time when there were some great, great people with great ideas, but the way they were being implemented and the way people mm. were being treated was pretty awful. And yes. so I came in to bring civility. Civility, let's value the people and not sort of, if you disagree with them, you send them all these flame emails. And when I ran, I was persuaded uh, to run for office. Initially, I was just going to be the membership coordinator. And then uh, through a series of events, I uh, became the president to finish out our term. And so one of my main goals was to bring civility where people would treat one another with respect. And to me, we all now suddenly agreed. It just means that we had to learn how to work together. Sure. So I, I got things back on an even keel 
and was happy to turn it back over so I could get back to writing. <laughs> yeah, that was really interesting part of the book too. I found it really fascinating that the, let's just say disagreement that was going on within yeah. LPA at the time. Yes. And yeah, you really had some hurdles to get through, but yeah, it's, it's, it was a, it's very, a really just, interesting story. Yeah, it was hard times. Uh, not too many people would have hung in there, but I actually felt like it, it was a calling for me to do it. You know, as a Christian, I felt obligated. I mean, the organization is too valuable to let it be taken down by some people who were very hard headed running it like a corporation and other people's mm. opinions didn't matter because that's what it was happening. Right. But the, and then there was, yeah, you know, there's always people who jump on the bandwagon. But we, there's none of those people that I wouldn't be happy to sit down in a room with and have a conversation. I'd be happy to see them. So I think we got right. through it and the organization is doing very well today. Excellent. Well, you mentioned dwarf tossing and that is what part two is all about of the book. I remember hearing about that, you know, maybe 15 years or so ago. I, I live in Florida. I'm aware of things that were going on here to some degree, but I had no idea the history of it or how far it goes back and that it's really a global issue, that it, the idea didn't even start here in America. So tell us a little bit about how uh, y'all helped to stop dwarf tossing from becoming as prevalent as some people seem to want to make it. Right. Right. Well, thankfully, I can say that's in the past as well. Yes. But so, but yes, it began in Australia. It was a bar room, you know, they come up with crazy things to do <laughs> to attract new customers back in 1985, mm -hmm. the first I heard of it. And I actually got a call from a reporter and that was, be I'm just thinking back to that. It was something that I had been doing. I started the roller deck of some of these reporters. So I got a phone call out of the blue asking me for a comment. Mm. And it was like, I couldn't believe my ears, you know, what do you mean they're throwing dwarfs? They were doing it for entertainment. And so I ended up, when I was right back at the first book, Dwarfs Don't Live in Dollhouses, I did include a chapter on dwarf tossing. And some people didn't understand why I did that. But I had used it as a framework for how do you advocate and make change. Uh. And so that was, I was thinking, are we going to be an example of a problem that I thought was going to go away? And in the case, when after Australia was talking about, we had an unfortunate run-in with a national syndicated columnist, Mike Royko. Anyone who knew anything about it, his name is not a good one uh, to say, but he titillated people's thinking about broadcasting and, oh, well, I wouldn't, wonder if it, that would take off here in the United States. You could tell he was making fun with it. But it yeah. was very discouraging, and so we, people at LPA got really riled up about it, and because he, he not only after his, he wrote about four comments over time, and he actually aroused enough interest for a local bar in Chicago, because he was based in Chicago, yeah. advertise a contest in Chicago. Yeah. So, you know, we, under Robert's leadership with you and Fred's event, stopped, and it got a PR thing going. A community organizing, bringing together uh, the all organizations. We actually had a member at the time, still a member, yeah. Craig McCullough, who worked for a legislator and a state representative in Pennsylvania. So he yeah. knew how to organize. And long before I ever learned how to do it, he knew how to do it. He pulled together, you know, all the different uh, groups in Chicago, all from a distance, you know. He was, Wow. to um, stand against it, and including the mayor's office. We had members of LPA writing letters and making phone calls, and we even got the attention of, of at the time it was Mayor Harold Washington, who was a, put out a public, he put out his own press statement against it. And so at the time, our community organizing public relations effort was enough to stop it. So the, the bug shut down at the uh, not shut down, the, the contest was shut down. Oh. And so that it was enough just during that PR burst. And but the idea keeps spreading. I went to Philadelphia mm. in nineteen eighty six and nineteen eighty nine it up back up in Florida. Oh, and when I had written uh, the chapter at Wolf Tossing, I said, Well, you know, if public relations, if a bar or the uh, managers of business, the head of business, ever, and the buyers never cared about what pub, bad publicity, the, it may need to go to the legislature to stop it. You mentioned hearing about it in Florida. 1989 is when it was so bad that the managers of this 
were taking the contest from town to town. Uh-huh. So the local people were bringing it to their town commission, uh-huh. but they moved on to the next town by the time they had a meeting. So you had to go, they had to go to the state. And how I got, I wasn't living in Florida yet, but they had read my book in that chapter on they said, well, we think we've got to the place where we need legislation because they are not responding what? to our attempts to stop it. Just from pressure, public relations pressure. And so I was, I, because I'd written a book, you know how it goes, I, I was invited onto a TV program with them and I think it was you had it, Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Okay. And yeah, so they got that bill passed in Florida to ban dwarf tossing in licensed establishments. It's a very narrowly focused law because otherwise it would be tossed out as too vague, too general, whatever, unconstitutional. So it had to be very targeted to the specific problem and where it was happening. So people could actually, if they wanted, go out on the beach and throw dwarfs, but there's no, but. It's, of course, it's the environment that gets people willing to do it. You know, too much alcohol, the crowd, you know, getting the conveyor wound up. And, of course, the sad part was that there was uh, people willing to be thrown. And so that did create a lot of conversation within LPA. So, well, who are we to try and stop them doing what they want to do? And so we had to come up with all the responses to the libertarian point of view, which I understand libertarian viewpoints, but they're, they are, in our, my opinion, and many others, thankfully, they had crossed a line by c- c- creating an activity that was dangerous, number one, because of the skeletal structure of some of the little person there. They, they, they had the, you know, traffic salt said because they put on a helmet and mm-hmm. knee pads or whatever, threw them onto a mattress. None of that was good enough. They could break their neck. They could, you know. So, but the other part that was really scary for the people in Florida is that the message that it was sending to the public that it's okay to throw to walls, so right. that an unwilling person they will pass uh, down the street and someone says, "Hey, let me throw you in the pick you up," and you're off your feet before you know it. And there was actually an incident where that happened. Oh, and more than one incident. Yeah, there's one fellow. He was a businessman. Visiting Florida at the time, and somebody did pick him up. He, he was a bit, uh, he was a salesperson, and, and it was very embarrassing for him because he was having this business meeting in a restaurant. And I can't just remember all the details, but I mm. hadn't known that until I talked to him a few months ago. But the, and especially the kids, you know how kids right. are. They, sure. they get carried away, get bullied. So mm. it used to be when I was growing up, I met this one boy who had. In his school, he'd been turned upside down in a garbage can, and he couldn't get out. They thought oh. it was funny mm. because a lot of persons' arms are often shorter. Sure. And, well, they short mine are. I think I'm disproportionate, but they're shorter than yours. But he couldn't lift himself out of the bin. So they just thought that was funny. So this, this is going way past that, you know, pick him sure, up and throw yeah. them. So it was the crazy people that you had to think about, too. And then, of course, it's degrading, dehumanizing, you name it. it. It shouldn't be permitted. So thankfully, the state of Florida outlawed it back in 1989. But do you think that was the end of it? Oh, no. no. <laughs> these, these, these same people that were in Florida, they moved to New York. And uh, they mm. picked up there. Well, little did they know that I lived in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right so, after them. Yeah, I, I I agreed to be the coordinator to have, get a law passed in New York because they were doing the same thing. They were moving around. And so, and of course, did media. And I wrote to our uh, little, where's the small group, 22 people, yeah. and that worked on this plot. Well, we got all the members involved in sending letters to their uh, representatives, but there was 22 in the core group that organized to get this law passed. And we got it passed. But Right at the end, Mario Cuomo, uh, you know, the father of, of the former governor yes. that just stepped down, he got a lot of flack about signing this law. And, but thankfully, he came through at the end and he signed it. And so, yeah, it was a battle all the way uh, to get it. To get, and I did go on the Phil Donahue show mm. with the organizers of this, plus two people who got dragged, dwarf tossies, we called them, the manager was sitting in the audience, and, and one of them was on the platform with me. I was the only wow. one at that, at that time. 
on the platform talking against it. And half the audience, I think they were college students, <laughs> the ones uh, that go to the bars, <laughs> uh, they were right. thinking it should be allowed to do it if they want to do it. And um, so, yeah, wow. but thankfully, we that was 1990. We got it stopped in New York. The law passed. And that Donahue exposure did help us get the word out. So 10 years goes by. And then in the meantime, I've moved to Florida. Right. And then some radio station decided they were, they wanted to have a contest because they had this mascot type person that worked at the station. And they, so they got a lawsuit. They filed a lawsuit mm-hmm. to challenge the constitutionality of the law and the theory with his right to work. So I was irritated, more than okay. irritated. Uh, yeah, beyond. <laughs> <laughs> but so we had to fight that one. And then, then after that, that the lawsuit didn't go right. anywhere. They didn't succeed. Right. And then 2011, another 10 yep. years go by. And now we've got this wild, because nobody could believe this, a legend, Florida legislator came in and tried to repeal the bill as being unnecessary, that it was a uh, historic archive, whatever. It, and he yeah. had, and Harvey, according to him, was getting rid of laws, you know, repealing laws that uh, no longer needed. Like, the, the law apparently, I don't know if it still is, but he named it as an example. It, you can't ride a bicycle with somebody sitting on the handlebars. So he put this bill in that category. The, the yeah, look. not quite. So... <laughs> So we had a wonderful president for LPA at the time, Gary uh, uh, Gary Arnold, mm-hmm. and he rallied the troops and he put together a team of people and they did call me. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. But <laughs> I got it. <laughs> so I was sort of more an advisor then. I did do some things. I did get the pleasure of writing. LPA was offered a an opportunity to write a, a blog post or a Huff post or a Huffington mm. post. Oh, okay. So what's wrong with dwarf Tarsi? And so I got to write that, which was really fun. And oh. to be able to get it laid all out. And and then there was another fellow who was the advocacy chairperson at the time. He put a change.org petition together. Oh, okay. And we got, and he had the brilliant idea uh, his name is Joe Stramando, uh, Stramando. <laughs> he had the brilliant idea of every time this petition is going to that uh, representative, every time someone signed it, it pinged on his computer. <laughs> <laughs> the legislator's computer. Oh, yeah. wow. Yep. Yeah. So he got, um, four, we got 4,834 signatures. Oh, wow. Ping, 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 oh, ping. I can imagine. On his computer. So nice. And yeah, so we had, oh, and this man, I, I couldn't believe how dense he was, how disconnected he was from our community. He submitted this bill to mm-hmm. repeal mm-hmm. in the Dwarfism Awareness Month, October. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, oh, all little <sighs> people are, wow. are tuned in to be making people aware of what it means to be a little person, you know, how to talk to us, how to put it work. And what we do, and um, so, and also, you'll be pleased to know, I'm sure, that Disability Rights Florida was yes. one of the people that uh, signed that petition, worked with us, sent letters and things. Yes, indeed. So we had a lot of support of letters in the American Association of People with Disabilities. He wrote, the president wrote a joint letter with our little people in America, it was just wonderful uh, the way all that came together and that just was building on everything we had learned in the previous decades right and yeah so and of course there's a lot of media that came along and all of that yes but yes. yeah the, the dwarf casting thing i don't ever want to hear about it again oh i bet i bet <laughs> oh oh the i've seen on the cake week somebody uh-huh. speculated i wonder if this guy's even met a little person so because at the time i was working for a uh, center for at living uh-huh. and i was appointed by the governor to the Florida Independent Living Council. So right. I had to be in Tallahassee. Okay. And it was, the, we were going around and cheering our platform and naturally the Florida Independent Living Council added the dwarf tar seat, you know, not allowing right. that bill to pass. We, that bill was to be blocked, not passed. So the repeal, we didn't want it repealed. So I got to meet this guy mm. in his office. He didn't want to talk to us, but we, uh, we said, well, we'll wait. He couldn't get out. He didn't have a back door. So, because we were waiting in, in, in his lobby. So, he finally agreed for us to come in. There was about six of us. 
And Robert and I both did. Robert's my height, three feet four, same height okay. as me. So I had to ask him, I said, how many little people have you met? And his answer, well, you and your husband would make it too. Oh. So he was clueless. Yeah, yeah sounds Absolutely like Absolutely clueless. He didn't know. So, you know, he would not withdraw the bill as we were asking him to. But and I suppose if he did finally agree to not promote the bill, he would just he wanted to let it die on the vine as opposed to withdrawing it. He probably had a good point, he said, but it would have been good for him anyway. Um he said if I withdraw it, then it's gonna come back front center in the media again. And he didn't want that. He didn't want uh, any more media about yeah. it. So so we had I had to make a different call about whether we could accept him saying he wasn't gonna promote the bill or not. And I told the team, I said, yeah, I think he's, he's, he's legit. He's not going to push it. Plus, we had met with the committee chairperson, and I had been, we had been assured that it was never going to see the light of day. It was never coming out of the good. committee. Right. It died. Good. It died in committee. Good, as it should. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Well, and then there's still more because there's part three, which <laughs> covers a wide variety of things, all about sort of just, you know, independent living, essentially access to ATMs and voting, transportation and more. So it, it starts with your advocacy regarding ATMs and also gas pumps being lowered from 54 to 48 inches, which, you know, that's just a six inch difference. And so it, it, it almost doesn't seem like, like, Okay, sure, just do it. But of course, that means so many, they have to re new construction and all this stuff. And so, of course, you get a lot of fight. But those six inches mean the world to, to, to yep. you. And so, anyway, tell us a little bit about the early efforts to make that happen. Okay. So, back in 94, um, we were, there's an organization which has a very long name, but, and I'm sure most people hopefully have heard of ANSI, which is a standard setting organization. Oh, sure. American National Standards Institute. Well, they have a committee for everything, just about. <laughs> right. And this there is one for accessible and use it, accessible and usable public facilities and buildings. Okay. And they they have categories of membership. It's not a legislative body, but it operates like one because okay. they write this building code. And so they have, and they have a category for people uh, with disabilities. And little people of America have never been a member. We were invited to join, and then LPA had to find someone to be our delegate. Now, I I had, I mentioned earlier, doing workshops. I used to do workshops and LPA events, and I, I remember a young girl, a, well, teenager, mm -hmm. saying to me, what are we going to do about ATMs? And I just looked at her and thought, well, <laughs> I didn't know what we were going to do about <laughs> right. ATMs. But that was in the back of my head when I was approached by the president at the time, Ruth Rooker, she came to me and said, well, Angela, we, will you be the delegate? And of course, I'm thinking, oh, and my husband, Robert, was saying, well, wow, it's going to be a lot of work. I don't know if you're going to get that. You're going to put in a lot of effort. I don't know if they're going to change it. Yeah. They don't want to change it because he, he knew from his job experience. So I did pray about it, and I felt like I had, and, and what Ruth said to me, well, Angela, if you don't do it, who will? Mm. Now, that sounds like I'm the only one that could do it. But at the time, I really was. I had, you know, two law degrees. I had all this experience with advocacy, not yet working for a Center for Independent Living. But and it, I also, anyway, and I could write, mm. which is what you really need to be able to do. And I can talk, yes. which is helpful. Helpful, yes. <laughs> so, so I did feel like it was a calling, mm -hmm. and I went to the committee. Now, I was like a fish out of water because it's a building code. I have known nothing about right, building, right. how to build. And sure. The, there's the code. Yeah, the members on there were the only architects and building inspectors, and, you know, it's all of that line of work, and I'd never uh, mixed in with people. Of course, I was comfortable with the people with disabilities, not actually knowing all about disability, but I've learned a lot from the other members. But we worked together, and that was important. The member from Disability Rights Education Defense Fund, who said to sing, has just recently passed away, Alan mm -hmm. Golden. She was my mentor in the beginning, she gave, giving me the ropes, and I watched how she operated and how she worked the room. <laughs> she knew everybody in there. She <laughs> could tell me who to trust, who not to trust. She'd been on, on, on it. She had been on there for years. 
And also, even the people who would never, ever vote with us, I learned how to work with them because they helped me write the code language. Oh. I know how to write, but I don't know how to write building sure. code language. It's got, it has to be very, the, no ambiguity mm-hmm. has to be very clear and, you know, how hard it is to write your instructions. And so imagine writing for building code. So, oh my gosh, right. I, and there were a lot of meetings and the, there was a cycle. They had like a three to five year cycle. The cycle was just bad. The timing was perfect mm. uh, for LPA to get involved. So I, I was on a learning curve for the first year or two and always the whole time on a learning curve, but you know, just learning the ropes, even how to operate. But we did Little People of America. Um, yeah, it wasn't an organization where you had, could have troops rallying outside and writing letters yeah. and things. It all the work happened in that room. And they called for public comments. Be, people could make proposed amendments, which is what I did for LPA, mm-hmm. proposed a reduction for, by the, from 54 to 48. But then it goes out for public comment. So there was a lot of interest, conversation, but they, there was, and she said, well, we can sympathize. I know they were very, you mm. know, not a good word no. for disability. I've been not looking for sympathy. Right. We're looking for change. We, um, so, but then they said, we don't have enough information. It's just the right height. And we definitely needed to make sure that we had the right height. So typically I found out very soon that when somebody was calling for Research, mm-hmm. it's a code word for delay, which in other yeah. words means we're not going to get to it. Right. So, because things had to happen in a certain order, and if you didn't get your proposal in round of public comments, then it wasn't going to be input until the next cycle five oh, years later. So, gosh. you know, it, it, there was a lot of rules and things how this group right. operates to learn. And so I figured it out, thankfully, they thought they had had us beat. When they said that about the data, and I said, "Oh, you you mean you need measurements? Well, how high can far, far can little people reach?" Mm-hmm. And I said, "Well, I can find that out for you because we had a national conference coming up, and we set up a." I love this part. We yeah, set, yeah <laughs> we set up a table. We mm-hmm. put out some M and M's or whatever they were, kisses, and people were lined up. We didn't have to persuade <laughs> anybody to line up. They weren't coming just for that little piece of chocolate. They'll go that out. They were coming because they wanted to use AGS. Yeah. And of course, it rolled yeah. over. It rolls over that change into everything. Right. That you have to touch, pull, turn, push, and uh, which is why the gas pipes were important too. Because right. with the way the world is going with all this new technology and automation, it was getting worse for little people, huh? Because you you no longer had some guy that you could that was standing outside that would pump your gas for you. Oh my goodness, right. those days. <laughs> <laughs> sure. sure. But they pumped not just for little uh, people uh, with disabilities, but everybody. Right. But nobody gets that anymore. Nope, uh, nope. Even though they'll tell you press the button and will come. Yeah, they don't they come. They don't come. No. They don't. <laughs> well, they can't because they don't have enough staff to then one person inside. Typically. Right. right. So, you know, that button is a joke. But so I make friends at the gas station if I have a problem. But anyway, I I just ask somebody. But yes, so it, I don't believe this reduction, this, I call it breaking the six inch reach barrier. Yeah. And I think in the book, I talk about this probably in way too much depth. I hope not. But no, anyone, who's, anyone who's interested gets to see how hard this change was. It took years and many debates. And one, one of the key people that persuaded LPA that we needed to be a part of this organization, ANSI committee, was an architect. And he represented at the time the hotel and hotel industry, who eventually, he was in favor of this change, but his organization took hold him over the coals at the time. Mm. And he <laughs> replaced it. <laughs> but he <laughs> was somebody who voted against it. But so I... He is the one who told me, don't ever miss a meeting. And that's because the mm. way the ANC works, whatever gets done in one meeting, they can revisit it at the next meeting. Now, the meetings uh. are going to be usually months apart. But when you have a meeting, it could be three days back to back. Oh, my gosh, really? You're, you're, in there, you're in there at 9 a.m. And they do break for lunch for an sure. hour and then typically break at 6 p.m. So you have your evenings to yourself. Right. But 
you're in there and in a big conference room with 40 other people, so it's mm. a big square and people are, are sitting back against the wall as well. And so I learned from them not to miss a meeting, but I also learned uh, from Marilyn and just observing everybody in there, how they worked, that you need to collaborate. And the, this change, the six inch reach barrier uh, that was changed, what I don't believe would have happened unless I uh, did my I did research to, to discover that half a million people were using wheelchairs and with mm-hmm. other disabilities, balance issues and things, they can't raise, they might have the length in their arm, but they can't raise it above their head to reach higher than 48. So we came up and it would, they couldn't fight it because it was in the federal regulations and the mm-hmm. comments that they make before they pass a law, pass a regulation. And so our data, back going back to the conference, our data came back overwhelmingly to show that 80% of little people could reach uh, 48. Now, not if we still have left some people out, but there are some very small people in our peer here and my lower, um, actually uh, myself, as a lower 10 percent, 10 percent of uh, height for dwarfism, but it's going to be hard to get it for everybody unless you get, you know, some remote ability to do it, which hopefully technology will bring one day. Yes, hopefully. But yeah, so we're still not all the way there, but <laughs> the, the resistance is huge. So that was the other reason why I felt like it was a calling for me, because not only did I have the education to do this, but also the ability to learn new things hmm. and, you know, research things that I don't understand or know about yet, <laughs> how to find out was I, you have to have the personality. You have to be willing to stand up against people who are vehemently opposed to what you're doing. And, and that's why, you know, in LPA, when people were vehemently opposed to ideas, we don't have to become enemies. And, and I saw it working appropriately mm-hmm. at the ANC committee. People were total opposites and yet they could go out and have lunch. You know, they were, they were friends. And yet, so it was a really good experience. And of course, thankfully, and I do believe it was God's work that he changed people's hearts because some of the people... I didn't know what they were going to do when it came to voting. Mm-hmm. And of course, there were many votes along the way. But I, and some of them I uh, actually confronted, of course, many of them individually. Mm-hmm. The one who was representing the physical therapist, not physical therapist, excuse me. She re- she was a physical therapist representing an association that works with people with disabilities. And I just said to her, because she seemed to be siding, she was siding with mm-hmm. industry. I said, I don't understand why you would be doing that. Yeah. <laughs> These are the people yeah. you're trying to help and you're not willing to have them change um, the code to meet their needs. <clears throat> and I think that kind of pulled her up short and I got her to think it. And she did vote the right way in the end. Okay. So that was must, must have had an impact on it. So, wow. yeah. Wow. Well, I can go on and on. <laughs> well, and there's so much good material in the book. I really do encourage people to buy the book and, and read these stories. And as you're talking, there's some really good aspects of advocacy that come up. First of all, to be an advocate doesn't mean you have to be an enemy. It means you can still no, be a friend, right. but you just need to be yeah. firm. And sometimes it even means a little bit of compromise. But yes, if in yes. the end the, the results are positive, then you've been successful. And so I think the yes. book is... It's really interesting stories, but I, th- I feel like anyone who works in advocacy could really read the book and learn a thing or two about how to even be a better advocate. So I, I really enjoyed it and definitely recommend it to others. Well, now that you've published this, I think you said this was your final book. Well, I, I say that I like <laughs> to think it's the final book because yeah. what happened with Fallen's the writing is the part that I don't enjoy in the marketing. Sure. And you have to market. market. Yeah. And what's the point of getting a book out there if nobody ever reads it? Right. So you've got to sort of some self promotion, and I don't really like to do that. It's probably pe- people look at what I'm putting out there and think, "Wow, she really likes to tune her own horn." I'm not. I'm trying to. I'm trying to get people to see, you know, what it takes to make change. Yes. And you don't have to give in. People will submit to things that are happening that they don't need to submit to. Right. You know, you can. And even if you don't win, you still have to do it. And that's what I said to Robert. Uh, he said about the dwarf tossing, oh, you'll never get that. Well, he didn't quite say it that <laughs> strong. I hate to see you waste all that time and it doesn't change. And I said, well, I just have to know I'm doing the right thing. I have yeah. to try. Yeah. And I don't have to know the outcome. Maybe I don't get it done, but I have to do it. It's like 
it, it you feel can I was propelled to do it. And so that's important. You've got to have that. You've got to remember why you're doing it because in the middle of it, well, you get really tired and you I'll get bet. sick of it. I'll bet. I'll yeah. Bet. Yeah. Well, th then again, that's always an advocate. <laughs> yeah, always an advocate. <laughs> but I do, if I could just add one more thing, and this is oh, like sure. the icing on the cake, and this going back to this architect, oh, yeah. John Soundman, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say his name because he's a wonderful guy who's now retiring. And he had his own business, Universal Design. So he just understood this right from the start about all being all inclusive. And he said, you know, ANSI forms the foundation for the Americans with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, mm, which we call mm -hmm, ADAC. Mm -hmm. He said they looked at ANSI because of the way they come together and, and the way that code is written. It's, just, it's a code that's a model code that then becomes law and states and local governments adopt it. But ANSI, excuse me, ADAC, the mm -hmm. Federal Access Board, looks at ANSI to see if they're going to make changes. And oh. so the timing was perfect because after the ANSI passed the lowering the reach range, ADAG or the Access Board was looking at their regulations and they wanted to harmonize them because there are differences and right. that creates confusion. Mm -hmm. So to have the federal law, the state law, the same. So they did put out a notice of proposed rulemaking in 1999, and which included the 48 wow. inches. Now, there's a lot of work that went prior to that that, you know, it yeah. was part of. But so, again, LPA went into high gear to get everybody to write a letter. There were public hearings. I couldn't go to all of them, so I recruited people to go to the ones they had around the country mm -hmm. just to stay front and center on their mind that there are people, little people out there that need this. And then on behalf of our piano, I wrote our comments, uh, 25 pages worth, uh -huh. not just the little letter, but, you know, compiling everything that uh, right. had been done and the ANC and so why, so they could see why the change was made. And ADAC passed it, it went into ADAC. So now it, it, it rolled over into the federal law as well. Oh, that's great. So that was not, it was always the hope, you know, sure. uh, but it, was it guaranteed? It, right. But it happened. The timing was right. Yes, indeed. That's, I guess sometimes just a little bit of luck doesn't hurt either. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it, you could call it luck or you could call it uh, divine intervention. Yeah, but sure. it's the timing. Yeah. Yeah, the timing was I, important. Yeah. So I, I just have three, I have many words, no words, but the three things that really guided me, preparation. Uh -huh. You cannot go in there if you don't know what you're doing. Right. You, and even if you're going into a forum that you're not familiar with, you've got to learn it. Persuasion. Yeah. So you have to be willing to find out what the argument, what the problem is. Why do people want to make this change? Find out why do you think that? What's the problem? That's where you have to talk to everybody in the committee, even if people who are totally opposed. Right. Find out what their issue is and then you can answer it. Yeah. Yeah. And then and my final penny, I, I like alliteration. Preparation, persuasion, and prayer. I really did pray a lot yeah. and I had other people pray. So I, I do, you know, credit card for a lot of this, but you have to be willing to do the work. Yeah, indeed. Great stories. So if people want to read more of these stories and they want to find Always an Advocate as well as your two previous books, how can they do that? Uh, they're all available for sale on Amazon, amazon.com and in the U.S. So, and you, Amazon UK also has it up there and I'm not, New Zealand's doing some funny stuff right now with the mail. But, <laughs> but it's because of COVID, sure, they suspended sure. mail delivery. Okay. But anyway, so Amazon.com, but for the other countries, Amazon, and you know, you get the code, so you have a double extension on it. But, and also, I also have a blog and my website, I, I write okay. a weekly blog post. And what's yeah. the address of that? AngelaMuravanitten.com. Okay. So it's my name. It's the name of the author, but it's all up close, AngelaMuravanitten. Right. And actually, the easiest way to pull out the trilogy, I call it a dwarfism trilogy, is just to type my name in the search box on Amazon. Okay. And all three books, all three books will come oh, up. perfect. The, the Dwarfs Don't Live in Dollhouses has been selling for a long time, it's out of print, has been selling for a long time, secondhand copies by some other person. Okay. And, um, but the ebook is coming out in December. Oh, good. But both, both the, the second and third book, Pass Me Your Shoes, and always an advocate of both print and ebook. Awesome. 
All right. Well, I definitely encourage listeners to to check out the books. I really enjoyed them. And thank you, Angela, so much for being the guest today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. Thanks again to Angela for being our guest today. Learn more about Angela, read her blog, and find all her books on her website, angelamuirvanetten.com. Thank you for listening to the You First podcast or reading the transcript online. Please email any feedback, questions, or ideas about the show to podcast at disabilityrightsflorida.org. The You First podcast is produced by Disability Rights Florida, a not-for-profit corporation working to protect and advance the rights of Floridians with disabilities through advocacy and education. If you or a family member has a disability and feel that your rights have been violated in any way, please contact Disability Rights Florida. You can learn more about the services we provide, explore a vast array of resources on a variety of disability-related topics, and complete an online intake on our website at disabilityrightsflorida.org. You can also call us at 1-800-342-0823. Thank you for listening to You First, the Disability Rights Florida podcast.